My boy, my friend, my home slice, Brandon Talks, made a video, Konosuba is deeper than you think, and I agree wholeheartedly. We are going to jump right into Konosuba today. Konosuba is great. Yes! That pretty much everyone and their grandma can agree upon. The comedy is hilarious, the character bounce is amazing, and the voice actors? <laughs> But oh, yes. there are certain aspects of it that go overlooked. The sheer boobs. No, I take it back. Millions of its writing that I believe deserves more attention. Connoisseur yes! has a lot more depth than people tend to give credit for. So I'm here to talk about it. Please but first, do. can we talk about what a Chad Kazuma is? Like, he is the perfect response to these generic blank face blahs that have plagued Isekai for years now. Is he insanely overpowered to the point? No, he's not! It's so beautiful. And he's also not this morally superior grandstanding arse face either. Point where nothing is interesting anymore? Nah. He's physically weak and has no powers, meaning he needs to rely on wit and strategy. Is he dense and thick as a tree stump? Nah. He's cultured and has common sense. He's not a genius either. I like that they didn't make him like overly smart. He's just kind of, uh, he's street smart question mark ish. And self awareness. Is he a simp? Yeah. No. Most of the time. He's Mr. Gender Equality. A fucking legend. I live my life by his principles. Man who's willing to drop kick even a woman if she deserves it. So real, so real, so true. I've drop kicked I've drop kicked so many women because of him. Thank you, Kazuma, for helping me in my quest to beat up women and men if if they deserve it only. Uh, if I would beat up a man, I'd also beat up this I would what I'm trying not that I'm I'm done Twitter, don't take this out of time. He's a guy who went to an isekai world and thought he was gonna have the time of his life, but instead was hit with reality. What team constantly get- Damn, can you imagine? This is the most real, most reality-driven isekai show in the history of time. Get mad because nothing in this world is ever what he hoped it was gonna be is hilarious. He is a breath of fresh air. It is so nice to have an isekai main character with a real personality. And it only gets better with the rest yeah. of the gang. Yeah. Yeah. Aqua has two brain cells. Darkness is a masochistic human punching bag. And Megumin, crazy as she is, steals the show every time. Yes! Megumin best girl, does Brandon agree? Is Brandon team Megumin? Let's freaking hope so, god damn it. More on that very, very soon. But the chemistry between all these characters is just the best <laughs> thing ever. It these is. guys genuinely I just, feel- I wanna see them do anything. Anything in the world. Like friends. They're all total idiots, but that's part of what makes it all work. They're a dysfunctional group of morons and you feel like you're a part of the family just by watching it. They're not afraid to insult each other to their face or tease them, or to get mad at them and squeeze their cheeks or to call out each other's flaws. And there's never any hard feelings. The beauty is, that's what friendship actually is. Friendship isn't about people that'll never tease each other. Friendship is about people that do tease each other and get a stronger bond through that teasing. They're just so comfy around each other to be themselves. That's what I tell myself at night after I just torture my friends for fun. In each other's presence. To just do whatever they want. And their personalities bounce off each other perfectly. It doesn't really matter that three of them are girls and one is a boy since they just treat each other the same regardless. Except, except, you know, uh, boobs. <laughs> except he has a boner every time he talks to, aside from, you know, that. Personalities just feel as if they're made for each other. And if one of them were to go missing, it just wouldn't feel complete. This feels real because this is how close friends in real life interact. And I... <laughs> you know, isekai, most of these isekai characters, they just run forever. Here you have these people and they're just like, <sighs> No, normally you watch an isekai anime and they're just flying through the forest, like jumping from tree to tree. And here you have these people winded by like a mild jog. The fact that the writer was able to portray this so well here is just so refreshing. The voice actors especially do a fantastic job and get jokes that were funny and somehow make them even funnier. Seriously, even just hearing Cosmo's voice makes me laugh. He could be talking about grass growing and it'd still be funny. He's never touched grass. <laughs> And then of course there's Megumin. Preach, King. Preach! She is easily the best character. Like, a lot of people out here saying, like, Megumin's not the best character, bro. I don't I don't wanna fuck her. I just wanna acknowledge that she's the best character by far. This is the very definition of, of best girl. When you search yes! up the words best girl, she will be the result. Megumin is no probably shot that's real. Wait, what? Probably the most popular character in all of Konosuba, and for good reason. Because not only is she arguably the least incompetent out of everyone in the group, uh, I don't know about that. 
know if that's true. <laughs> I think the beauty is all of them are equally incompetent. That isn't saying much. But she's also, in my opinion, one of the funnest to watch. Which she's the funniest character for sure. I, I love the Chuni vibe so, so much. In the world of Konosuba is a difficult thing to do. She's the adorable little sister archetype. Except this time she's the type of person who'd fawn over a cute animal, but mercilessly kill it if it gives her a ton of experience points. So based. So real. So true. So based. Oh god, I love how malicious and evil she is, just like me. She starts off with her entire obsession with explosions and her Chuni personality. Which is fun, but could have easily gotten old if that was all there was to her. Just it isn't she so much more than that, dude. I still have to say, with so much reality in my heart, that there is a full movie of about Megumin, and it is the best anime movie I've ever ever seen. Just like a certain someone. But instead of letting that define her entire personality, it only shows up during key moments. And during those moments, the explosion oh, itself isn't necessarily the joke. Instead, it relies on the context of the scene and her personality, which results in a different joke every time, which doesn't get repetitive. And when she doesn't get overtaken by her tuny personality, she's surprisingly mature. Actually, now that I think about it, her personality can be quite similar to Cosmos in some aspects, since they are both cunning and mischievous and are willing to use that to get whatever they want without- Yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Yes, sir! They're both assholes. I love how you could uh, basically translate <laughs> cunning and mischievous into just, yeah, they're assholes. <laughs> any regard for human decency. They both have a lot of intelligence and yet tend to make a lot of stupid decisions, which is basically the exact opposite of Aqua, who lacks intelligence most of the time and yet has her moments where she does show real intelligence. But regardless, because their personalities have a lot of similarities, their relationship is genuinely one of the sweetest to watch. I especially love the scene where Cosmo first starts taking Megumin on their explosion walks, where they just go- Hold on, you're not a- Megumin can make explosions, right? She puts all of her skill points into explosions because she absolutely loves making explosions. So she puts so much of her power and time and energy into honing her explosion to make her explosion as powerful as possible. But her explosion has become so powerful that it drains her of all of her MP to the point that she can only make one explosion per day and then she's completely drained for the rest of the day. But she loves it so much and wants to keep training. So she goes with Kazuma to the middle of the forest in the middle of nowhere. So she can make an explosion, a massive, glorious, climactic, orgasmic explosion. And then she can't move, and Kazuma literally has to carry her back. Go <laughs> together so Megumin could explode something, and Kazuma carries her home after she expends all her mana. He doesn't have to do it, in fact, he'd very much prefer to not have to do it. And yet, he always ends up doing it for her. This is the, my favorite joke in Konosuba. A lot of people talk about other clips in Konosuba, like the sword clip or whatever. This is my favorite gag in Konosuba. How for episode after episode, he carries her to the middle of nowhere that she can cast an explosion on this abandoned castle. And then like two episodes, Episodes later, this guy shows up and saying, Who keeps exploding my castle? I don't understand what I've done to you. What? This is like, it's actually peak comedy. Anyways, which says a lot about his character, but more on that later. I really love this scene because Cosmo usually acts like a jerk whenever he's forced to do something that he doesn't originally want to do. But here, he actually gets into it. He and gets he familiar with things. the explosion. So yeah, that explosion was at 8.7 out of 10. It means explosions and shows a real interest in it. And is quickly dubbed an explosion connoisseur by Megumin. A title which he actually holds with pride, even to this day. I just love it whenever- She's so cute, because they're like, actually- so it, originally when they would go to explode things, like they would go together like all annoyed and sadly. And then later, Cosmo as they started venturing together, they had this song that they made Bakuretsu, Bakuretsu, da da da. Explosion time! It's explosion time! There's a whole sign here saying no explosions, please. Genuine enthusiasm towards something. It's so rare, but that's what makes it special. These two share a bond over something so ridiculous and simple, and yet it works so well. And this bond only go stronger as time goes on, especially in the light novels. And it's not just these two. All of these characters have an emotional bond with each other. And when they're interacting with each other, that's when I feel that their personalities truly shine. None of these characters would really work on their own, but since their personalities are so different and yet so similar at the same time, when they do stuff together, it just creates a life of its own. It's... nice. It's beautiful! It's beautiful. It's glorious. I love it. Part 2. The first five minutes. Okay, so I have said two things about Konosuba in the past. The first is that the character dynamic is great, but the second is the first five minutes of the first episode of this anime is some of the best writing in isekai history. 
I feel it goes overlooked just how well the writing establishes everything within the first episode, especially in the first five minutes. The writer had to make sure that yes, it makes sense, but he also needed to clearly demonstrate what the story is all about, its tone, as well as its characters. And in Konosuba's case, it needed to do all that while being funny at the same time, it, it, which is a lot harder than it seems. It, I mean, originally, I wouldn't think it would be so difficult, but, but, emphasis on but, that was beautiful, but, emphasis, oh. But, oh, what was I even talking? I don't even know what I was talking about. Oh, most isekai anime, they have a premise that they need to get through. Guy was there, he dies, he gets transported to another world. And they, they make it like as cut and dry as possible. Like even in slime isekai, which is a good isekai. Yeah, this dude, he's walking down the street, he meets someone else, he's like, oh man, I'm old and single and a virgin and, and my dick is small, just like everyone in Taku's Twitch chat, and then, oh man, that's so rough out there, and then, then he freaking sees some random couple, and it's like, oh, that couple's younger than me, ha ha, that, that's, that's so cringe, oh. Yeah, look at that, look how, look how the couple, they're so... <laughs> and then a random dude stabs him, and he dies, and he says, delete my browser history, and then he gets transported to another world. Like, they had to come up with a way to make the whole getting transported into another world bit actually funny, and they did it in Konosuba. Konosuba is glorious. It establishes, not only does it establish the characters and the premise, but it also establishes just how funny this show actually becomes, how it is throwing everything on its head. So how does Konosuba do this? The first real thing that happens in the show is of course Kazuma's death. It gets the classic situation of Truck-kun is about to hit an innocent bystander, and our hero jumps in the way to save them, sacrificing themselves in the process. Naturally, this would lead to the hero being sent to heaven where he meets a beautiful goddess who sends him to an isekai world thanks to his pure right, nature, right, right. where he goes on quests right, with right, few right. girls, yeah, fights yeah, monsters, yeah, yeah, and has overpowered yeah, abilities. Yeah, yeah. But I'm Like a literal other character in this show, by the way. I also I also love that he meets someone else who an actual nice person instead of an asshole like Kazuma. <laughs> and that dude's crazy overpowered. Has the harem, has it has it all. He has it all. And Kazuma's the little asshole dude. <laughs> I love this show so much. Then this happens. Schrodinger's panties. Does she wear them? Spread those The tractor was gonna stop before it hit her. His wholesome hero death was cringe. Tractor? Was it even a truck? <laughs> and he died of shock. It didn't even hit him. Ah, he died of shock and pissed himself. It turns out that the truck wasn't a truck, but instead was a harmless tractor. All Cosmo did was randomly shove somebody, collapse on the floor thinking he got hit by a truck and proceeding to die of shock. Now first, this obviously establishes yeah. Konosuba as a parody. It's a show that takes common isekai tropes and flips them on its head for a joke. But the writer also had to be careful about the way he did this. There are many other ways that you could have parodied this scene that might still have been funny, but ruined several other aspects of the show. For example, there really could have been a truck that was about to hit an innocent person. And Cosmo, instead of jumping in a way to save her, could have just walked right past. And then the truck would randomly swerve around the girl and hit Kazuma instead. This situation would have still established Konosuba as a parody. And this still would have been Except, probably funny, depending no, on your sense no. of humor. But if it had- That's actually cute. That's a cute idea, but no. If done this, it would completely change the tone. It would go from something a lot more like- Here's the thing. Kazuma may be an asshole, but there is good inside him. He's just like me. Like, I'm an asshole. But there- I would argue that there is some good inside me as well. Don't. Ch chat, just say nothing, please. I'm so happy that I'm having these scuffed basement streams right now that the chat is not showing up on the screen. But listen, <laughs> oh god, everyone in chat's like fake news, prove it. All right, whatever, whatever. There is no record to what you're saying, okay? Which isn't really what Konosuba is at all. But by far the biggest change this would have would be on Cosma himself. We all know Cosma. He's a self-censored butt with bad behavior who does whatever he pleases. But Just like me for real, for real. But he isn't heartless. If this scene with Cosma walking past someone who was about to get hurt was really the scene that happened, it would have solidified Cosma in my mind as an irredeemable piece of garbage and I Bro would have, he would have pulled out the Jack Horner card would probably hate him there's a reason the entire saving someone who's about to get hit by a truck scene is a trope in the first place if you get a lazy neat who does nothing but stay inside and play video games all day it's kind of hard to get behind them even if you do relate to them but when they see Bro. 
Also, their ass is too fat. Someone in danger and willingly sacrifice their own life to save them, that creates character. This yeah. is the first real scene we see of Cosma doing anything of substance, and he willingly jumped in with the intention of I'm saving someone at the cost you of his own both, life. Bro. And while it didn't turn yeah, out the, the way he hoped page. it would, the intention was still there. We know that based on just this one scene, that no matter how much he acts like a douchebag, and no matter how much he pretends not to care, that there's more to him. Bro, is, this, is he talking about me right now? Bro, is he just... Is he diving in, deep diving into my own asshole? And then meets the eye. And by having Cosma intend to do the right thing and instead be punished for it, it also puts us on Cosma. It's just the no one understands Nux video. <laughs> side. This scene managed to get the best of both worlds by both parodying the original trope while still maintaining the reason it was there in the first place. And we got all this from one single joke. Really well done. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that, um, that I'm such a narcissist that I feel like this character is just like me for real, for real. But in, on, in all on, I wouldn't jump in the way to save some person getting hit by a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I am, I, I try, I strive to be more like Kazuma one day. I'm just a <laughs> fucking loser streaming. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. The scene after this also does a great job of establishing Aqua's character as well. At first, it portrays her as if she's a pure and divine goddess, but then it pulls yes. a reversal on us and has and her mock Cosmo's stupid death for fun. Then she bends the truth and convinces Thanks, him to go to the other too. world. Then when Cosmo's deciding which item to pick, she starts eating potato chips and asks him to hurry up. Then after Cosmo gets mad at her and drags her to this new world out of spite, she practically has a mental breakdown in the middle of the streets. But I, I wish that you would have dwelled a little more on the actual twist in the first second of uh, her telling Kazuma, Kazuma, you can take any one thing with you to this alternate world. And Kazuma's just like, mm hmm, and she's laughing at him, and she's making fun of him for having a humiliating and pathetic death. And he's just, mm hmm, and she's like, dude, you freaking loser. You died for nothing and pissed yourself. Pick something, whatever. You want a hell holy sword? And purely to fuck with her, he picked her. I have spoiled actual and real life de life altering decisions i could have made for the sake of pettiness and i love him for this so much he's so beautifully petty it's glorious it's like a level of pettiness that i i strive to achieve kazuma is the the ultimate main character. I love him. But as soon as Cosma figures out what to do next, she recovers pretty much instantly. Each of these moments give us a different side to Aqua's personality that makes her a multi-dimensional character that doesn't just rely on a singular trope. Yeah, we all remember Aqua being useless and dumb, but the show doesn't rely solely on those True. things and showcases True. multi- She's also entitled and bitchy and doesn't wear panties and has great boobs and doesn't wear a bra and also has good hentai and also rule 34 is crazy and there's some weird incest stuff going on with her sister goddess lady there's also some cool lesbian stuff and and i've seen an entire arc of my beautiful goddess trapped in another other aspects of her personality as well. She may be dim-witted, but she also has her moments where she acts cunning as well. She's also lazy and selfish, but also sensitive and temperamental. Because Konosuba never relies on a single character trait, it means that Aqua never feels one-dimensional or flat. But instead, it uses those traits as a basis for her character to take on its own life. And that goes and for- I like how also all the traits do kind of fit into each other really, really nice. All of these like different facets of her character do fit together. You know, she was the um, the pampered goddess lady that never had to work for anything in her life. So because of that, she never had to worry about coming up with something. She never had to work on her intelligence, work on her stra stra strategic mind, work on her entitledness, work on her sensitivities. She literally had never needed to better herself and her personality in any possible way. And that made her and turned her into the blue thing that we see before us. For everyone in the main gang. And as much as I complain how overdone her jokes are, that includes darkness. Konosuba is constantly giving us characterization through the different situations his characters are put into and what they do in response. We don't really seem to think about this sort of thing because it's done so well. But if it wasn't there, we would feel it because everyone would feel flat, one dimensional, and boring. But you know who's not flat or one dimensional? <laughs> Aqua or darkness, both of them not flat. Instead, it gives us quirky and unique Dragon. characters with strong personalities. Characters who may have memorable traits, but aren't completely defined by them, leaving room for other dimensions of their personality as well. But, but was she wearing panties? But aren't completely right, right, so defined by okay, them, leaving room but, like, let's, for let's other di really take a little dimensions of their personality let's, let's think, as well. What is going on? I must know! How are these guys likable? It is a miracle that these guys are the way they are, and yet they manage to be not just- I 
put my pants on one nipple at a time just like everybody else. Just likable, yeah. but lovable. Usually if a character is selfish, arrogant, stupid, and useless, you'd hate them. Or at the very I would argue that I am selfish, arrogant, stupid, and useless, and, and people don't hate me. Well, that's not true. People, damn. I'm really, I'm learning a lot about myself through this video. I'm learning a lot about myself. At the very least, dislike them. And yet, we love them? But if Please love me, guys. I need some love. I need some... I need some affection and appreciation from somewhere in my life. Of course we do, you say. We don't love them despite their flaws. We love them because of their flaws. Yeah. While I can agree with that sentiment, I also feel like there's a bit more to it than that. Because if giving a character flaws was all you needed to make a character likable, then people would absolutely love Gabby. Or Sa- <laughs> No! Sakura. Or Show Tucker. When that is definitely not the case. No, so for this, I'm gonna. about the flaws, bro. No. Let's talk about Kazuma and Aqua again, as they're both the perfect example of how to make terrible people likable. I, I love terrible people. I am literally a terrible role model. If any of you in my chat right now think that I am a role model of some sort, go away. Get the hell out of here. I don't want to be nobody's role model. Don't even say that. Don't even think about something like that. I am no role model. I'm just some fucking idiot doing my own fucking nit shit on online. Okay, get the shit out of here. Could talk about Megumin, but it's pretty obvious why she's so likable. She easily has the most positive traits out of everyone in the team, is a ton of fun to watch, and is also the most active character out of everyone. And all the stuff I'll be talking about also applies to her too. Kazuma and Aqua, on the other hand, shouldn't be likable. Kazuma is a lazy douchebag who uses gender equality as an excuse for sexual harassment. How dare you! An excuse? I've lived my life by this man's mantra, how dare you? And Aqua is a useless drunk who breaks down in tears at literally anything. They are anomalies because they're the worst kind- Oh my god, it's literally me and Fifi. Because they're the worst kind of people, and yet they somehow manage to be likable. Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, being a lazy douchebag does not make you the worst kind of people. Right, guys? Right, guys? Support? Please, guys. Anyways, Cosmo, for example, may be a giant douchebag, but he's not just that. Yes. He's an understandable douchebag. No! That wasn't where we were supposed to go with this! See, the beauty of Kazuma's character is that despite his obvious douchebaggery and low self-esteem, he's a good guy. He is a good guy that puts other people um, above himself in some ways. When Kazuma first came to this world, for example, he was excited, ready to start a new and go on exciting adventures, only to be slapped in the face with disappointment over and over and over again. We totally get- Yeah, but he saw boobs, so he's not that much like me. <laughs> Ah! Wait, was that a cell phone? Why he would dislike being in this world, and his constant fed up attitude makes sense to us. In the scene where we meet Matsurugi, he, let's see, damages their cage, insults Kazuma, acting as if he doesn't deserve his companions, even though he's the one who's doing all the work, and then actively tries to get them to leave Kazuma uh, and join him. And then when they all try to walk away, he tries to challenge Kazuma. This, this fight, this is easily one of my favorite fight scenes. Kazuma to win Aqua, even though their difference in level is so obviously huge. So when Kazuma gets a jump in him and- Bro, it's like, I challenge you to duel. Okay, challenge accepted and he goes and beats him in instantly. Steals his sword fair and square. It's a victory. The guy got what was coming to him. And what's crazy is this guy is a representative of what your average isekai protagonist would be. The dude with the crazy overpowered weapon that has the harem that's revered by everyone. And he is the Konosuba version. And sometimes being the little- Slimy dude is gonna get you ahead in life. And when Cosmo stays inside and refuses to come out, it's like, of course he would. The outside world is dangerous. He's died multiple times, yes. and he's got yes. as much money as he needs right now. Yes. Plus, it's cold. I'm so real for that. God damn. We want to stay inside. I will, I will stand this man for all of time. Dude. Oh, you're gonna laugh at me, actively mock me for my stupid death, and be an overall bitch to me for no reason? Well, then I'll just find a loophole and drag you down to this world with me. So real. You just He's a beautifully petty little fuck, and I love him. I love him. He, he, okay, I would say that there are relatable traits to him, but, but we differ on many ways. Like, for example, I may have many flaws. Laziness is not one of them. I am an incredibly not lazy and incredibly ambitious fellow. Uh, despite this fact. Also, while behind the scenes, he's and in his monologues, he's just as much of an asshole as, uh, as he is outwardly, despite his good-natured side to him, I would say that I am definitely playing up my assholery, while in real life, I am, uh, the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Deserve it. And plus, he never actually intended for her to stay there because he thought she could go back. And after, like, two seconds, Aqua doesn't even care anymore and just finds being in this world fun. She constantly forgets about trying- I love this show so much! ...to defeat the Demon King and get back home just and the even- the vibes that they have together is so wholesome. 
forgets that he was a goddess at one point. But going back to Kazuma, he doesn't always act like a total scumbag. In fact, a lot of the time, he just behaves like a normal person when people are nice to him. See, here's the thing that I, I feel like you're you're almost, I don't want to say missing it, because you I love this video. This is a great video. But I think the one little tiny detail that I would like you to hone in on a little more is the fact that Kazuma is just a normal guy. Like you keep saying, aside from being a bit of a obnoxious douche, he's still a normal guy. No, that is what makes him a normal guy. Normal people are assholes. <laughs> Listen, probably not everyone, but but there there is an assholey side to most people, and I love that he's just unabashedly himself. When people are nice to him, he's nice to them back, and he even has moments where he goes out of his way to be genuinely nice to people. But more on that very soon. Almost every time Kazuma does something that could be considered trashy, we always feel like he's a hundred percent justified in doing so, and Konosuba does that by making. Okay, I don't know about a hundred percent justified in doing so, but like you know, somewhat. So that every single time he behaves this way, it's almost always in direct response to something bad happening to him. Aqua also does something similar, although I slightly love different. Aqua. Her I love her. Current stupidity should be annoying, especially if she's constantly mucking everything up. Except it's not, because her fantastic boobs do not have a bra. And so every time she has a schizo freak out, so do her breasts that jiggle and bounce in every direction possible. Instead, it almost comes off as kind of endearing. And that's- no, It does, it does. She's freaking cute. Because the stupid thing she does does have some form of logic behind it. <laughs> I thought the customer was already right! Anyway, I'm a goddess. I can do what I want. In the Lizard Runner scene, Kazuma has a problem. He can't tell which one is the king. But Aqua has an idea. If the Lizard King is the fastest one, then all she needs to do is attract their attention with magic. And whichever one gets there first is the king. Except the problem with this idea is that if the lizards come their way, they're gonna get trampled on. Don't worry, Kazuma. I'll get you out of prison. Just use this stool to reach the bars and saw your way out. How are you supposed to get the stool in here in the first oh. place? Listen, it was a good- You can't really get mad at her, she's just trying- <laughs> She's trying her best. <laughs> she's trying her best, she's trying so hard. And help, it's adorable. Oh, <laughs> she's trying so hard. Then just having Aqua do dumb stuff because she's dumb, you can see why she would make that mistake. There is logic behind it, all that's happened is that she's overlooked some very important details. She's Here's the thing, Aqua does not think ahead. This is again coming from that same pampered lifestyle as a goddess that she had for so long. She cannot possibly fathom bad consequences to her actions because everything was just on a silver platter her whole life. She's not necessarily stupid, she just doesn't always think things through. The second main thing that the show does is something I like to call the give and take principle. Remember Abu from Aladdin? Uh, I promise this is relevant, just hang Okay, <laughs> alright. Hang on. Yeah, when Aladdin went down to the Cave of Wonders, Abu kind of grabbed something that he wasn't supposed to and caused all this to happen. And at this point, we're all like, oh, come on, Abu, really? Why'd you have to do that? You ruined every- Whoever he was, he's long gone with that lamp. <laughs> Uh, you know what, he's okay. The principle is that whatever a character takes, they also need to give I back. Like that. That's a good, that's an interesting uh, theorem. I whatever like bad it. things they do need to be balanced out somehow. And this applies to everyone in Konosuba, especially the three girls. Even in regards to their powers, they have high tier jobs and are extremely powerful in what they specialize yeah, with. They're all incredibly good at what they do. Darkness is an incredibly powerful crusader, except she has zero accuracy, so she's good at tanking hits, but she can't actually dish anything out. And Megaman is an incredibly powerful sorcerer. She can make these massive explosions on a level that's incredibly impressive due to by everyone's standards, except she can only make one explosion a day and then be totally useless. And then there's Aqua. God, I love Aqua. With, but also have massive drawbacks to balance this out. Megumin has the most powerful attack, but she can only use it once for the day and can't move by herself afterwards. Plus, of course, there's her personality. Dark has an impenetrable defense and is pretty much invincible, but she also can't land any of her attacks. <laughs> Plus, of course, there's her personality. Aqua is a powerful healer who can heal everything and can literally bring you back from the dead, but she has no combat skills and attracts the undead. Oh, she's so good. I love this show. Like, the massive drawbacks to these incredibly overpowered abilities are just so glorious. They make you think that, well, they're, they're, you get to have the highs of your favorite characters doing incredibly awesome things at the same time as having the incredible lows. Plus, of course, there's a personality. But the oh, fucking personality. The main reason I bring this up is because of how this theory applies to a deeper character point of view. When it comes to Cosmo, he's actually a good person at heart. While he does have his moments where he acts scummy, he also does many genuinely good things throughout the series. And by having him do these things, it solidifies our respect for him. When Cosmo realizes that they just got paid for fixing a problem that Aqua caused in the first place, he feels... <laughs>
<laughs> oh my god, dude. I love the, the levels of moral integrity here. Or rather, the lack thereof. He feels bad about it and returns the money because it just wouldn't be right to keep it. When he gives Megumin's parents snacks and they start arguing over it, he realizes just how poor they are and gives them all the food he has because he knows they need it more than- I love that movie so much. ...than he does. And in one of my favorite scenes in the entire show, Megumin is at her lowest point. She has a lot of character development in the movie and here yes! she makes a choice. She she doesn't want to be selfish anymore, and she painfully makes the decision to give up on her life dream to learn normal magic. If she did, it'd be easier to protect the people she cares about. What's so wild is she would be a much more powerful and useful member of the team if she actually put her skill points in other areas instead of just keeping them all in that same one explosion spell. She doesn't want to be a burden, she doesn't want to watch Cosma suffer, and she doesn't want to be powerless to help even if that means giving up her love for explosion magic. Not being able to bring herself to do it, she hands her adventurer's card to Kazuma and asks him to press the button for her to learn advanced magic. And Kazuma knew just how much this passion meant to her. Ever since he met her, she was crazy about explosions and refused to give it up, even if it meant not being able to this find a- like, you know, giving up, giving up your dreams for someone you love and that person that you love loves you back and is saying no don't give up your dreams for me i will give up my dreams for you it's like the most beautiful and wholesome relationship ever it's such a beautiful show party until she met them and now the fact that she's willing to give that up shows just how much she's grown kazuma makes his decision and hands like, the card where do you see such blatant character development in an isekai anime and like for one of the quote-unquote harem characters of an isekai anime it doesn't exist. The show is actually glorious. Back to her. And he asks her to give one final explosion. So she does it. And it's the best explosion she's ever done. And we realize that instead of making her learn advanced magic like she asked, he buffed her explosion spell instead. Megumin was willing to give up on her dreams to change, but Kazuma knew what made her happy and already liked her the way she was. Uh, he didn't want an it's, excellent maid. Nice lesson, he bro. just wanted Megumin. And that's why they're the best couple ever. Seriously though, this entire section exists because I just wanted to talk about the movie but forgot to put it in the outline. <laughs> but getting back on topic, Kazuma is a good person. No matter how much he tends to have his moments where he acts like lazy or like a self-entitled jerk, at the end of the day, he's a guy who cares. He has a lot more depth than we tend to give him credit for, and he makes up for this bad oh. behavior by both the consequences- Oh, I love that scene. That's one of my favorite scenes in the show as well. This is also in the movie. ...that happened to him as a result, and most important- Why do I feel something hard pressing into my butt? Because something hard is pressing into your butt. Apparently, ah. the good that he does. Likewise, when it comes to Aqua, she actually contributes to the plot. We like to joke about how useless Aqua is, but in reality, her presence in the show is anything but useless. If you remove her from the equation, you have just removed a huge chunk of Konosuba, and pretty much everything that happened wouldn't have happened. If Aqua well, no, didn't mock Kazuma in the beginning, he wouldn't have dragged her down with him. And if Aqua didn't come with him, they wouldn't have partied up with Megumin in darkness, and the entire story would be different. There's a cause and effect. Aqua's mere presence in the show makes a difference, for no, better awesome. or worse. In the fight with Beldia, she summoned a flood which destroyed the wall, putting the team in debt. However, if it weren't for her, Beldia would have never been defeated in the first place. In a fight against the mobile fortress destroyer, it's only because of her magic that they broke down the barrier in the first place, thus giving them a fighting chance. And they also used their mana to recharge Megumin. And going back to the lizard runner scene, Aqua- <laughs> She's just a portable charger! <laughs> She's like, she has all, she's a goddess, right? So she has like infinite mana, right? She can do anything except she's terrible at actually using magic. <laughs> she sucks. <laughs> so she did just use her as a battery pack <laughs> to recharge Megumin who actually could do something. <laughs> Oh man, it's beautiful. Aqua may have caused the problem in the first place, but then it's balanced out almost instantly. First, Aqua's the one who suffers most from this mistake since she's in the front line of getting trampled. But then after this, when Cosmo falls- See, you probably think, but wait a second, Darkness is a masochist. Why don't all the masochistic stuff happen to Darkness? Well, you see, because the creator of the show is a sadist. And torturing a masochist just isn't fun enough. As a sadist myself, I could sa safely say that torturing sadists Torturing masochists isn't fun because they enjoy it. It's just terrible. You know what I'm saying? This is why me and Fifi will never be and dies of his own accord, it's because of her that he comes back to life. She has also brought Kazuma back from the dead multiple times. And while some of them may have been her fault, there's no denying that Kazuma really would be dead without her. She also purifies the lake, gives Kill a peaceful death, purifies that thing purifies the that lake. Kazuma really would oh be dead without God. her. She also purifies- They lock her in a box in the lake. 
<laughs> Time to a rock in the corner. Oh, dude, I love this show so much. Purifies the lake, gives Keel a peaceful death, purifies the house from all the ghosts, and saves the Axis cult from Hans, even going as far to scold her own hands in order to do so. She also has several moments where she does stuff that's actually amazing, but just in the strangest situations that isn't really useful for adventuring specifically. Like how she can create masterful paintings, is an excellent what? construction worker, and is an amazing performer that can perform magic tricks that blow even Cosma's mind. Basically everything except for actual combat. But we don't- Basically, she's useful in every way, except the ways that she's needed. She's just like me, for real, for real. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. And here I am talking about frog vor hentai. Don't really think about these things because every time Aqua does do something useful, the show ignores it. Or finds a way to frame it as if she did something useless, even though it wasn't. Plus, the show loves making her suffer the consequences of her actions and oh, yes, yes, having yes. cousins. Oh, well, 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 oh me, oh my, if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. I'm a bully her. You can't really get mad at her if the show doesn't let her get away with everything. And when she isn't crying, she has a ton of charisma and is just really fun to be around. Granted, they still have their moments where I just want to punch them in the face and scream, why would you do that? Especially in the light novels. But I always end up liking them again in the end. And I suppose that also kind of serves to make things feel more real, since we all have those kinds of moments with close friends and loved ones. They do some really stupid stuff. <laughs> you have close friends and loved ones? Could it be me? <laughs> Times, but I still love them regardless. The point is that while Aqua doesn't really contribute that much in regards to the fighting, she still exists in the story for a reason and does stuff that makes a difference. Whatever Aqua contributes, she finds a way to take it away. And whenever she screws something up, she always makes up for it in the end. And the thing is, the show actually calls this out. Kazuma directly states that all of Aqua's good deeds are cancelled out by her negative ones. But that's a good thing! All that really means is that her negative contributions have been balanced out by her positive ones. And the show frames that as if it's a bad thing. But that's what a good character should do. I love that guy too! I totally forgot he existed! It's kind of genius because it makes us understand why Cosmo would be annoyed at her without actually making us annoyed at her. So that's why Aqua's useful. Ish. Useful, asterisk. Useful! Te teeny weeny little... Join the Axis Cult. Part 4. Improving the source material. Okay, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, I never read the light novels, so this is new to me. As an adaptation, the Konosuba anime isn't perfect. There is a lot of cut content that I really think would have been great to have animated, especially in the movie. Wiz's introduction, for instance, was cut out completely, making it confusing when we first meet her because who the heck is this and why is Wait, everyone- was Wiz's introduction really cut out of the anime? I remember meeting her. Huh? Nani? Huh? As if we already met her. And all it really gives us is a two second flashback and a really short explanation. Oh, okay. There was the, the flashback. That's that's what we- Alright, okay. In the movie, there were also a lot of sweet scenes between Kazuma and Megumin, the introduction of the Tranquility Girl, and we get to explore the Crimson Demon Village more. Plus a- Bro, you just want that Megumin content. You just want more Megumin Kazuma moments. You're such a goober. Ton of great uh... jokes as well. There were also some very important lines of dialogue cut from the bath scene with Kazuma and Megumin, which- Yes, we needed more time! in the bad scenes you are so real for that damn you you just you are so real for that homie totally changed his perspective on her from viewing her as a kid to an incompetent junior, which is one of the main catalysts behind his eventual romantic interest in her. But the one thing I really wish was animated is recording this part like on a beanbag chair. It's like, you know, I'm gonna go to a beanbag chair to record this part. <laughs> was the dust swap chapter. This chapter not only introduced dust in his party properly, but it also gave us perspective as to just how important Cosmo is. It starts with a drunk dust approaching Cosmo and mocking him for choosing a low-level quest despite okay. having high-level party okay. members. Okay. I didn't that know that they did this! I'm gonna go back and read the light novel now, dude! I actually love Konosuba so much. Kazuma just died recently and is still healing. He implies that because Kazuma has the weakest job, that he must be holding his team back. And Kazuma gets frustrated, but ignores him. That is, until Dust starts loudly talking about how Kazuma's planning to create a harem, and how he must live a blissful life free of suffering. Oh. And at this... This Ka is how wrong you are! I am surrounded by three women all day long! You have no idea how much I suffer! Alright, that was a little... That was Azuma snaps. Pretty ladies. Haram. haram? More like Haram! Got him. Thank you, Top G. You said Haram. Hey, are those things in your eye sockets made from glass? Where are the pretty ladies? <laughs> My eyes are bad, and can't see any pretty ladies, alright. Why don't you change your glass eyes for my lousy ones? Oh shit, man. Harem, you call these piles of meat and breasts a harem? 
<laughs> After this, Cosma states that a fucking idiot. Oh my god. He gladly switched for the day. To which a confused dust goes along with. So Cos read you my Aaron for yours. What is going on? Cosma goes off with Dust's party to hunt goblins, while Dust goes with the girls on their own quest. And I, I want to see Dust suffer, 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 make them suffer, women. You got this, women. Team women. Woo! Sorry, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm just excited. Listen, I just want to see Dust suffer. Cosmo does a fantastic job. Originally, he was supposed to just carry luggage, but when things go wrong, he saves everyone time and time again. Despite being low leveled and weak, he uses his wit and creativity to get them out of trouble. And, and that's exactly how he wins the whole show. Like, you have to realize, this guy is not overpowered in the slightest, which is so glorious. No way home, Dust Party apologizes for looking down on him, seriously wishing that Cosmo could join the group. And when they get back to the guild, Dust and the girls are a wreck. Aqua and dust out crying, carrying an <laughs> unconscious darkness and Megumin. No! The, the entire quest was a disaster. Yes! And that's now real. Failure! Let's break it down. The only thing more fun than seeing people succeed. Seeing people miserably fail. Realizing just how much Kazuma has been through, tearfully apologizes and begs to be let back into no. his group. This team needs <laughs> Kazuma. For our connoisseur, always a time when one of the party members from the main gang isn't there, and each time they barely manage to finish their quest. But without the cum that keeps the sock hard, thank you, Chet, for not helping me! Everyone's out there, that's us, Nux, no, I knew there was something somewhere. I just have to dive a little deeper to get that metaphor to work. Yes, yes. Cosmo, they didn't even manage to start the quest and they already fell apart. This story also gives us a great feel for Dust's personality, basically being Cosmo, but worse. I really wish they put this story in somehow, but probably thanks to budgetary constraints they couldn't, which kind of sucks. I would have taken this over to Succubus episode any day. Yeah, the second thing Succubus episode is kind of mid, not gonna lie. I wanted to mention was the art style, which is pretty hit or miss for me. On the one hand, I love how quirky and expressive it is, and it fits really well for oh, its style I, of comedy. I absolutely love the art style. I love the expressions and just the janky head movements that they make. But on the other hand, is of oh, let's freaking go. Hold on, go back. There's of course the saggy boobs, which. I'm honestly not a huge fan of. I disagree. This is exactly how boobs work. As someone that's seen so many boobs. Shout out to boobs. I love them. But also some of the character designs, which makes some of them look way older than they actually are. For instance, Megumin's friends. Here, they are clearly in high school and they look to be about the same age as Megumin, because they are. You can tell by their designs that they are teenagers. And this is how they look in the anime. I see nothing wrong with I see nothing wrong with this. I don't see a single problem anywhere in sight. I am looking, I am contemplating, I am thinking, I don't, I fail to, I fail to see even a single complaint. I don't. I'm sorry. What? They look like they're in their 20s. Oh, Rue looks like she's in her 30s. Are you telling me that these are supposed to- that there, that is a positive anime edit. Let's freaking go. Let's go, baby. To be teenagers? Are you telling me that they're meant to be the same age as Megan Me and Union? How the heck did we go from this to this? Also the light novel. Creative differences, creative liberties. I think that was an easy dub. Easy anime adaptation W right there, not gonna lie. Well, style is a lot prettier in my opinion. Yeah, the anime art style has its charms too, but part of me also kind of wants no, it to- It does look awesome. I do love the, the, the art See style. what the art style from the light novels would look like on a small screen, since there really is some beautiful artwork here. But with all that said, out of the things that they do adapt, I think they do a fantastic job. Its comedic timing is spot on. Its oh, voice nice. actors, as stated before, do a, scene with the do a fantastic job. Its comedic timing is- This scene with the sword is so good. He gets this new sword, he's so proud, he knocks everything over because it's too long. Spot on. Its voice actors, oh, as stated before, do so a- So real. Not easy carrying around a sword this long, am I right guys? Am I right guys? A phenomenal job. But one thing that I want to bring up is that throughout all of the adaptation, they're just adding in so many little things constantly. Little details that I just love for no reason. Sometimes in a movie or show, I just notice tons of little great things that it does. You can tell it has a lot of passion yes. and love. Oh, oh, the hand movement. It's put so into beautiful. it because. Oh, be dude. Of these things. Oh Even if my they god, how beautiful was that? That hand motion had a bigger budget than Berserk's entire anime. <laughs> aren't that obvious and don't really contribute anything to the story. Things that make you say, hey, they didn't need to put that there, but they did. And it just makes you appreciate it so much more for that. And Konosuba is full of this. Like how every time someone calls Kazuma's name, he always responds with, yes, I'm Kazuma. Or this yes, I do love Kazuma Desu. Kazuma Desu. Kazuma Desu. Kazuma Desu. This moment when Aqua goes on a purification rage against all the ghosts in the house only to interrupt it with nature's beauty. Or how in the in-between slides they always see Konosuba in a different way. Or how in the intro the gang just bobs their head along to the yes! music. Yes! 
it's just satisfying. Oh. I love Kono Subarashi, Kono Sekai Fukuo. Even just how perfectly Aqua hits this high note in the outro for season two. Like, sir. Dude, he's so cute. I love Brandon. You, you're such a cute YouTuber, you know that? You just is nobody gonna stuff. talk about how much of great singers these guys are? Actually, I just love the ending songs as a whole. There's just something so peaceful and nostalgic about it. Contrasting with the madness that happens during each episode, this ends things in such a nice way. They made a drunk Kazuma version of this song. The Bakuritsu song, the wiggly thing. Bakuretsu, They do in the intro. The yes. Countless Editor, editor. Can made you, a um... drunk Kazuma version of this song. The Bakuritsu song, the wiggly thing they do in the intro. Intro, the countless amazing facial expressions. There are a ton more examples that I could do, but that would just get repetitive. You might as well just watch an episode and you'll get tons of examples. No, I think that's the moral of the story here. Guys, watch Kono Suba. Watch Kono Suba. Kono Suba is glorious. I'm aware that these things don't really do that much, they but at the though. same time, they, they just so do flavor. so much. If that makes any sense, and the fact that these things are done so often and consistently for all of Konosuba means that it all adds together, and the sheer amount of passion and effort put into it just oozes out of it. I felt this way about Knives Out, I felt this way about Parasite, and I felt this way about Konosuba. I can't believe I just compared Parasite to Konosuba. But regardless, you could tell that everyone, from the writer to the director to the animators, the voice actors, sound designers and composers, that they all just had a ton of fun working on it. And whenever everyone on all levels of production do that, you can tell. And the fact that the jokes that are adapted are improved upon and are even funnier than they are in the source material makes me really appreciate it. Not every adaptation gets that, especially when it comes to comedy. I still may have some criticisms, but at the end of the day, I still think they did a great job of adapting the light I'm novels. Speaking about the light novels... Oh. Oh. Sato Kazuma has a character arc. It it sounds ridiculous, no, but it's there, and probably not in the way that you think it is. Now, I'm not going to spoil the light novels just yet, since I know most of you watching haven't read them. However, I, I highly not. encourage you to do so over at CG Translations. It's a fan translation where you can read the entirety of Konosuba and for completely free too. I'll leave a link down in the description, so if you want to, go check it out after watching this video. They didn't sponsor this or anything, I'm not big enough for that yet, but they're really cool. Just avoid reading the comment section, trust me. But back to You'll Cosmo. get there, bro. I like your videos. You will freaking get there, homie. Home dog, you got this. His character arc isn't a typical one, because rather than having a character arc every story arc like usual, he has just one. And it's a character arc that spans the entire series. Because of this, Cosma is still at the beginning of his arc during the first two seasons, which makes it seem as if he has no arc at the time. I mean, and it's a very episodic comedy, right? So it seems like nothing really moves, nothing really specifically evolves, you'd think, right? You'd think that kind of, you know, just want to keep running the same stories time and time again without nuances or improvements in any ways, because this is an episodic comedy. But when all the characters start developing, when we start learning more about Darkness, when we start learning more about Megumin as the story progresses, you start to realize that this is more than just a collection of funny moments. This isn't Big Bang Theory, it's something so much more. And because of its subtlety, you probably wouldn't notice it throughout Konosuba until you reach the end. As said before, when Kazuma first comes Wait, to this- Wait, did Konosuba's light novels actually end? Is there an ending to this story? <gasps> what? Well, he is slapped in the face with disappointment over and over and over again. Nothing is the way he was hoping it was gonna be. And because of this, he builds up a kind of resentment towards this world. He goes back to his old habits of staying inside, only going out and doing stuff when he absolutely needs to. And whenever he dies, he doesn't really want to go back to that world. And even says the only reason he came was thanks to the false advertising on Aqua's part. In this scene in season one, where he dies in this world for the first time, he's excited of the thought of going back to Japan. <laughs> Thinking like, he can't go. go back, he openly complains about how terrible his life is here and how much adversity he's been through. And yet, after all this complaining, he begins to cry. While he himself isn't fully aware of it, a part of him really does doesn't want to leave that world behind. And this part of him grows throughout the series. Now, if you haven't read the light novels yet- So that's the character arc, it's appreciating where he is right now, that's... That's, that's really wholesome. Please skip to the time code on the screen. I oh shit, man, I, I am, I don't want to spoil it, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm not spoiling it, I'm skipping it, I'm- I'm doing it. Go. See, when it comes to spoilers, I generally don't care unless it's something I truly love. Like, uh, and I really love Konosuba. Right, we're skipping the spoilers. He hates. Because as much as he refuses to say it openly, Kazuma loves this world. It's crazy and stupid and flawed, but it's also fun, kind, and even beautiful. There is a monologue from Volume 11 that you could easily miss if you weren't paying attention. No. 
I may have instead come to the realization that this strange world isn't that terrible in itself. I looked down at Axel City from the mountainside. The expansive, blissful scenery presented ahead emotionally inspires me. Alright, after all we've been through, who's to say that I haven't fallen in love with this world already? Uh, it's home, and there's nowhere else he'd rather be. Because with every uh, ridiculous so adventure awesome. he goes on, and every new character he meets, the trials and every panties he steals, the romance and victories, everything that Kazuma has been through means something to him. And those things, annoying as they were in the beginning, were always worth it. So basically, he's a massive tsundere. Now, Kazuma still has flaws. He's no! still a lazy scumbag who yearns for true gender. Wait, am I a tsundere? He's a lazy scumbag who understands that the world and the people in it were never going to be perfect, or anything close to it. But he can appreciate it all the same, accepting it for its flaws, experiencing life as it is, and loving it anyways. And that's kind of beautiful. Now, I want to say that despite everything I've talked about in this video, Konosuba is far from perfect. It eh, is very excessive perfect. with its fan service. Oh, I see nothing wrong. I, I see no complaints. I see nothing wrong with uh, this. In this what video, you, say? you say that like it's a problem. But it's far from like perfect. It is very excessive with its fan service. Show me the excessivity. I see no excessiveness on my screen right now. Just like I see no panties. Schrodinger's panties once again asking us the big questions. Are they there or are they not? Gets kind of messy towards the middle of the light novels, at least from a structural perspective. And while ending was great in my opinion, it was also very abrupt and felt like it wasn't quite finished yet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, seriously, it just ended with so many uh, loose Cosmo and Megumin get spirited and novels. not that funny. And while the animation is very expressive, I also understand why people would say that it feels low budget at times. No, because I love it. it is. I'm not trying to claim that it's a masterpiece of literature or anything I like that. Bro, you really think that Moby Dick- why would you even put that here? Moby Dick was cringe. Obviously gifting this wonderful world with blessings is, is better. That. But despite all these things, I really enjoy it all the same. And that's kind of ironic considering that's one of- I love this guy! The main messages of Konosuba. It really is a great show that has a lot more substance behind it than we tend to give it credit for. And because of that, I truly believe that its writing deserves more attention than it gets. But you wanna know what also deserves more attention than it gets? Subscribing to Mr. Brandon Guy! Me. So real. Nah, just kidding, but the fact that you've watched this far is absolutely amazing. It is, I'm amazing. Thank you, I agree. Thank you. If you want to help support this channel, please give this video a like down below. Oh my god. Dude, check out Brandon Talks. He makes great videos. I like his anime stuff. I, I specifically asked him about reacting to his things, and he's very cool. I really like him. Uh, and he's gonna be doing an interspecies reviewers video, which he already promised me that he was gonna do I told him he had no choice to do it And he said he would do it because I basically strong harmed him to doing it But then again, I mean it's his own gain. It's for his own gain is what I'm trying to say This was a great video sir and Konosuba is glorious. I positively unabashedly Adore Konosuba. I think it is actually one of the best anime I've ever seen. Like subscribe and follow me on Twitch. Stay weird fam